Today on Blue 58, we're wrapping up our tour of the Packers roster with a look at their defensive backs, and there are some pretty strong similarities between corner and safety. Both positions have some high-end talent, but some big questions about depth. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. We've got a bunch of players to talk about today and a great chapter of blood, sweat, and chalk to get to as well. So let's dive right in. Starting with the Packers cornerbacks, as an overview of the the cornerback position group, I think you can say pretty safely that this is a solid position group with some questions. There's definitely some high-end talent there, definitely some high-end athletes there, uh, but there are some serious questions as to what would happen to this group if you start removing some of those pieces. Say, for instance, Jair Alexander misses some time. What does this position group look like then? Radically different. It's a strength right now. How quickly does it go to a weakness? Maybe even not as much of a strength uh, if some people other than Jair Alexander go down. I think as it stands right now, you can piece together a pretty strong group from the parts the Packers have on the roster. But if there start to be any injury issues at all, uh, questions are going to pop up fast and furious. Let's dive into a position by or player by player look though. I've got two guys among cornerbacks for whom I have pretty high expectations for very different reasons. The first is Jair Alexander. Really no notes for Jair here. What do you want from him more than what he's done already? Okay, catch a couple more interceptions. Sure. That's kind of fickle anyway. Just keep what you're doing. 2021 we're looking for Jair Alexander to have basically another pro bowl all pro caliber season. And really, there's no reason to not expect him to perform at that level. We don't need to talk a lot about Jair Alexander. We know he's good. If everything goes well this year, he should be great again. Not a big surprise. But also facing pretty high expectations this year has to be Eric Stokes. 2021 first round pick, probably the Packers' most physically gifted corner if you look at his combination of size and speed and just overall athleticism. And look, he's a first round pick. He's going to have expectations that go with it. The good thing for Stokes is that I think his role is going to be pretty simple this year. But if he can't figure it out, that's going to be a big problem. So what does meeting expectations look like for him this year? I think a couple different things. First, if he doesn't at least out-snap Kevin King this year for non-injury reasons, we should be concerned. I would expect that Kevin King will probably be close to, if not, the actual starter this year, at least a nominal one. But Eric Stokes should be getting playing time early. And if he doesn't surpass King by the end of this year and ultimately out out snap him, play more snaps, we should be concerned. The bar basically then is be a starter, at least in name, by mid-year, if not the end of the year, especially if the Packers are heading towards the playoffs again. That should be the expectations for a first-round pick you should be starting for your team within your first year, if not right out of the gate. I think they're going to ease Stokes into it slowly, but if he's not taking over for Kevin King by the midway point, surely by the end of the season, if not for injury reasons, we should be concerned. And I think it would be totally fair to be concerned. What about Kevin King then? What do we expect from him? On the one hand, I think you've got to have slightly elevated expectations for him, maybe not compared to just last year, but just in general compared to the average guy because the Packers went out of their way to bring him back. Sure, it's on what amounts to a one-year deal. Sure, there are some you know, other considerations there as to what that deal really means. But it looks like for all intents and purposes, he's on a no-cut contract. The Packers are going to keep him on the roster uh, unless you know something really unusual happens here early. But on the other hand, what is there about Kevin King that would make you have anything resembling high expectations for him at this point. He's hurt a lot. When he's healthy, he's inconsistent. Even in 2019, what everybody points to as his good year. What other than that, though, makes you think that he's going to be a high-end starter or even contributor this year or beyond? Honestly, I can't think of anything. So for King, just be out there, stay healthy, I guess, for the second time in your NFL career. And if he can do that, the Packers at least have some options in their secondary because he is at times adequate when healthy. Man, there is the faintest praise possible for Kevin King. But still, he's got some some nice physical attributes. He's tall, long, a handful to deal with at times. 
for both the Packers and the opposing team. Uh, but, man, just stay healthy, I guess, and at least give us something to work with. Chandon Sullivan next up. I've got pretty moderate expectations for him as well. On the one hand, going with the multiple hand approach here, as with King, he's probably the Packers' best slot corner. On the other hand, we all saw how much that counted for when the Packers played against a quarterback in a team who could isolate him. The Buccaneers made a, prior- made a priority not only to go after Kevin King in the NFC Championship, but to go after Chandon Sullivan as often as they could they tried to get him matched up one-on-one with somebody. And look, the Buccaneers have good wide receivers. That is a big reason that Tom Brady went to the Buccaneers. It wasn't just Tom Brady carrying the Buccaneers through the playoffs, as, well, everyone in NFL media apparently would have you believe. He went to the Buccaneers because they had elite skill position players and an elite defense, and look where that got him. That's kind of the Tom Brady story. But to his credit, Tom Brady found the weak spots in the Packers' secondary, and exploited them. The Buccaneers knew that they could exploit Chandon Sullivan if they went after him consistently, if they had people who could do that, and they did, and they did. They had players who could make him pay, and they had a quarterback who knew how to target him, and it worked out. Against most teams, he's going to be at least adequate in the slot. And like some of the other cornerbacks on the roster, maybe, I guess, similar to Kevin King, He does have some nice physical attributes. He's a pretty good athlete. He's pretty good size for a slot corner. There's a lot to like there in the best of cases. So what does that look like then? What does meeting expectations look like for Chandon Sullivan? Don't be a liability is a phrase that we've thrown around a lot the last couple episodes, but I think it fits for Sullivan. And don't be a liability, I think, is a sneaky high bar that kind of sounds low, especially at corner. Because think about what happens for corner. Either you don't notice them at all, or you're watching Scotty Miller sprint past them for a touchdown at the end of the first half. Just to use a, a really example. Not trying to not trying to pick on Kevin King with that example, but in the best of circumstances, you're not noticing Kevin King on that play because he's done his job. In the worst of circumstances, well, we all saw what happened. Not being a liability is really the base level job for a, a guy that you expect to be on the roster. Sullivan cannot afford to be anything close to a liability for the Packers, and the Packers really can't afford to have him be one because he's pretty unique on the Packers roster. Think about it. What other slot specialists do they have? Jair Alexander can play in the slot, but they'd like him to play outside as well. Kevin King certainly isn't going to move into the slot anytime soon. You'd think Eric Stokes is, Stokes is probably not going to play that role either. At that point, you're starting to get pretty far down the list. Shamar Jean Charles has been mentioned as a possible slot corner, but... You really want a a rookie fifth-round pick out there doing that duty. Uh, If you don't have to, I think we all know what the answer to that is. So if Sullivan can lock down that role and at least not be making the Packers' defense actively worse, that's a win. Don't make the team actively worse. Again, sneaky high bar, but it's it's what we need from him. Kadar Holman is next on my list here. As we start to get to the point of the depth chart where things are not really not really clear as to what these guys are or what their roles are going to be. But given a couple factors for Kadar Holman, I think we have to have what I would say are moderate expectations for him. For starters, he's been around for a while here. Uh, the Packers drafted him a couple years back, and, and he's had some time to figure out what it takes to be an NFL-level cornerback. On top of that, he's got some v- great physical tools. He can run like nobody's business, maybe close to as fast as Eric Stokes, who might be the fastest guy in the Packers roster right now, certainly can run with anybody out there, even Marquez Valdez-Scantling. On the other hand, Holman has shown that he doesn't really have the skills to get onto, onto the field on defense on a regular basis. And I'm as sympathetic to guys that are exclusively special teamers as anybody, but at a certain point, you got to kind of pick one. Are you going to be an exclusive special teamer or are you a guy that can actually have some, some viability beyond that? So for Holman to meet fairly moderate expectations, I think he's got to just be one or the other, be a corner or be a special teamer. Ideally, you could be a small-time corner, maybe a fourth or fifth corner with some real special teams gift. That would be that'd be nice to have around. But if he's going to be a corner, show us that you can play actual defense. And if you're going to just be a special teamer, let's just have him be that and move forward, not expect anything beyond 
beyond those contributions from him. Shamar Jean Charles, the 2021 draft pick, also I think is facing pretty moderate expectations this year, the, the highest of the remaining guys at corner. I don't really know what to expect from him functionally this year, but he may be the best slot option beyond Chandon Sullivan. Kind of has that rangy, ball hawk kind of build uh, and some good lateral movement skills. But what kind of opportunities is he going to have? So between his role that he's probably going to be playing, probably limited to slot corner, and the depth chart itself, it's hard to not have more or less than moderate expectations at moderate at best expectations for the the draft pick. I think because he was drafted this year, the expectations are a little bit higher. They're expecting him to come in and, and be worthy of a draft pick instead of just going with an undrafted free agent or somebody else in that spot. They went through the trouble of spending a draft pick on him. So you've got to have slightly higher expectations, I think. But not knowing what his role is precisely and not knowing where exactly he stands on the depth chart relative to everybody else makes this a bit of a murky picture. Now we're into guys facing low expectations, and there's one name here that you're you're going to say either, well, you're selling him way short, or yeah, that's about right, and that's Josh Jackson. For me, I'm not sure, a lot like Kevin King, how your expectations could be lower for Josh Jackson at this point. And we've got to address the rebuttal that I've seen going around on the on the internet related to Josh Jackson right now. And it kind of boils down to two words. But scheme. Yes, it is true that Josh Jackson has probably been a poor scheme fit for the Packers to this point in his NFL career. I will acknowledge that. But also I will say that you cannot be that specialized as a player and expect to really make it in the NFL. If there is just that narrow of a role where you can not even succeed in the NFL, just be a viable player who belongs on an NFL roster. I, I got to tell you, man, that's that's a pretty big ask from your theoretical NFL employer there. Sure, Mike Pettin's scheme may not have been a good fit, but you can't look like you're in completely over your head in one scheme and then convince me that you would be absolutely perfect in another. You can't tell me that it was just such a bad fit for you that you do not look like you belong on an NFL playing surface. That cannot be the case for a guy who's trying to be an NFL player. Look, for example, at Casey Hayward. Casey Hayward was not necessarily a good fit for Dom Caper's scheme or how I guess he was used in Dom Caper's scheme. But you know what he did? He played pretty darn well when he was healthy. The only problem was that it never seemed like he was all that terribly healthy. Sure, he had three seasons where he was at least active for 16 games, but he was frequently pretty banged up. Josh Jackson doesn't even have that excuse. He can say, or I guess his supporters can say, well, it's not a great scheme fit, and that can be true, but still, you got to find something that you're good at to say, all right, there's some potential here, and I don't think we've seen that from Josh Jackson at all. So Jackson here has to just not look like he's in over his head this year, at least look like there's a chance that there's something worth playing with here. He hasn't shown that so far in his NFL career, which is why I think the expectations for him have to be pretty low. Beyond that, we've got a couple project players. KB on Into, cool name, nice athlete. Got to translate that athleticism to football at some point. Still looking like a project. Expectations are pretty low. Finally, we talk about Stanford Samuels, one of last year's undrafted free agent darlings. Unfortunately, I think I've got pretty ex- pretty low expectations for his season again here. Man, does he have a tough climb of the depth chart ahead of him. Look just at the guys we know are probably lining up ahead of him this season. Jair Alexander, no chance you're getting ahead of him. Kevin King brought back on basically a no-cut contract. Eric Stokes, a 2021 first-round pick. You're pretty much no better than fourth already. Then look at the good bets, I'd say, for guys that are ahead of him. Chandon Sullivan, our restricted free agent tender signee, uh, pretty defined role. He's probably ahead of Stanford Samuels pretty comfortably. 2021 draft pick Shamar Jean Charles, yeah, again, probably ahead of Samuels as a draft pick alone. And then Josh Jackson, a 2018 second round pick, a maybe, but even so, even if Jackson isn't ahead of him, that's at least five other guys who probably are. So you're looking at the sixth spot at best for Samuels right now. And we haven't even thrown KB on Ento or Kadar Holman into the mix. If Jackson is ahead of him on the depth chart, that puts him at seventh and camp hasn't even started yet. 
that is a pretty tough ask for a guy looking to make the 53-man roster. I think he's got as good a shot as anybody, but it is an uphill climb. So to meet our expectations this year, I think he's got to make that climb somehow and make it to the active roster at some point this season. Practice squad looks like a pretty good bet for him to start the year, but hey, anything can happen once injuries uh, start popping up. And if Samuels can make it to the 53-man roster, I think that's quite an achievement for him this year. What about safety? Safety is similar in some ways to corner. There is some high-end talent here. In fact, the Packers may have the best starting safety duo in the league, but really, what do they have beyond that? I'll tell you right now, I don't really know. But let's start with that high end, though. I think we can breeze through Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage here pretty quickly. Adrian Amos, obviously, I think high expectations for him. He's polished, he's professional, he's consistent. Just keep being that dude. Uh, I got a question the other day from a listener on YouTube about who on the Packers is capable of making the Pro Bowl for the first time this year. I think it's Adrian Amos for me, uh, just because he hasn't seemed to, to garner the kind of league-wide recognition from you'd expect for a guy who is as consistently good as he is. He's good in a lot of unspectacular ways. Showing up and doing your job is not necessarily going to get you a lot of Pro Bowl votes, but he's always Johnny on the spot. He's always in the right place. And uh, when the ball comes near him, he seems to make plays on it fairly regularly. Even if he doesn't make the Pro Bowl, though, I think we can expect Adrian Amos pretty safely to perform well this year. And if he doesn't, it's going to be a big surprise. So pretty high expectations for Adrian Amos. Even higher, though, might be the expectations for Darnell Savage. Maybe the highest expectations in the secondary, at least going from what he did last year to this year. He had a strong, strong finish to the 2020 season. Other than the NFC Championship game when Chris Godwin made that ridiculous catch over him on that third and eight bomb from uh, from Brady, which is really the play from that game that I personally haven't let go because think about how that game changes if you don't get a 53-yard conversion on third and eight and then score two plays later, what if they're punting there, the Packers go down and score, you never know. Could change the entire complexion of the game. But Savage has to show that he can be that guy who played so well in the second half of last year. He may get some different opportunities in Joe Barry's defense than he did in Mike Pettin's. Some more opportunities to make plays, be around the ball, play that star position that Barry likes to talk about. If that is the case... I think expectations go even higher. Playing a different role, getting to use your athleticism in some different ways. Got to be sky high for Savage this year. I think he can play up to it, uh, but it it could be challenging too. Expectations drop off pretty significantly from there because we've got either guys that only have, well, that are only going to be expected to do what they're doing because the Packers made a bit of an unusual move or guys that just have been around for a while and uh, have some corresponding expectations with that. First guy in that list is Will Redmond. I've got him on with moderate expectations on my score sheet here, only because the Packers brought him back. They went out of their way to re-sign Will Redmond. That raises it for me, otherwise it couldn't possibly be lower. I have stuck with an analogy for him over the past couple seasons that it looks like there's a red flag above his head every time he's out on the field, or maybe just a blinking, flashing neon sign that says, throw it here, whenever Will Redmond is out on the field for the Packers' defense. He has been, at times, that much of a liability. But right now, somebody's got to be the third safety. And Redmond, just given what's holding over from the roster last year, might have the inside track right now. But just please, please do not be that kind of liability for the Packers this year. A couple guys I think the Packers, and certainly me, are hoping um, take some reps from Will Redmond, if not make him unnecessary altogether, are Vernon Scott and Henry Black. Sure, moderate moderate expectations for both, but both were nice little cameo players last year. Scott has better athleticism. Black seems to be a better projection from college to the NFL. He played that kind of safety linebacker hybrid in college and may have an opportunity to really contribute in that kind of a role this year. Scott, meanwhile, is probably a better athlete, and we need him to be more than just an athlete this year. Really look like a contributor, harness that athleticism, get some more reps just beyond special teams. 
The guy who I'm most excited about that kind of fits that same sort of billing, though, is Christian Uphoff. 2021 undrafted free agent. Look, low expectations here, but he's got to be kind of the 2021 version of Vernon Scott or Henry Black. I like him a lot as a roster sleeper. He's a good athlete. He's got good size. The depth chart is working against him. That's why the expectations, at least for me, are pretty low this year. But he has to make the roster, I think, to make expectations there. Beat one of the guys ahead of you. Then the Packers will will look like they really have something here. Scott and and Black and, and Redmond, I guess to a lesser extent even, shouldn't be counted on as roster locks. There is an opportunity there especially if the Packers are looking at keeping three, four, maybe five safeties again. Upoff could make that roster, and uh, if he does, he should at least be a, a core special teamer uh, given his um, height, weight, speed sort of measurables. Finally, Innis Gaines. I honestly have nothing to say about Innis Gaines, but somebody's got to be the last guy we talk about in our 2021 roster preview, and the winner of that prize this year is Mr. Gaines. Uh, best case for him is probably making the practice squad, but you never know, uh, given the the opportunities that may be available on the Packers' safety depth chart. We're going to talk about Blood, Sweat, and Chalk, Chapter 11 in just a moment. But first, I want to take a second and shout out three listeners who support us at patreon.com slash thepowersweep. Jameis Kuntana, Velko Popovich, and Felipe Busara, uh, Burasa, excuse me, checking in from Brazil, uh, all supporting the Power Sweep uh, on Patreon since 2020. Appreciate all of your support, these three individuals in particular. And I just want to give you an opportunity again to head to patreon.com slash the power sweep and uh, become a Patreon supporter there. Every little bit helps us make this show better and better. Uh, and I guess um, continues to, to make it possible because you are the people uh, who help us pay for what we need to pay for to keep this show on the air and up and running. So appreciate everybody's support there and I would encourage you, if you uh, want to support what we're doing here, to head over there. So check out the link in the the show notes here, or just remember the address. It's not all that hard. Patreon.com slash The Power Sweep. Become a supporter there today. Blood, Sweat, and Chalk, Chapter 11, focuses on zone blocking. I love this chapter in particular uh, because it kind of gets to the heart of of something we've touched on a few times in this book uh, in the form of this quote. Hell hath no fury like an old coach being told that a thing is new when he's been watching it for decades. Layden uses this line to refer to Howard Mudd, who we brought up a couple weeks ago, talking about the, uh, a couple episodes ago, I should say, about power sweep, uh, because he was on the receiving end of it. Well, not the receiving end so much. He saw it firsthand as a player on opposing team. But he talks about zone blocking at length here. But... He remembers it much differently than a lot of the NFL seems to in that he remembers seeing it a long, long time ago. And the more you read around, the more that seems like that was very likely the case. And it's easy to see why uh, when you look at some of the the schemes that have popped up before. You can see how zone blocking stems from the early days of football, a lot like the single wing. At its most basic level, zone blocking isn't about blocking one guy one of their guys with one of your guys. It's about getting a bunch of guys moving together in one direction and blocking whoever happens to be there. And think about the single wing back in the early chapters of this book. What does that all boil down to? Ultimately, it's running, power running, by getting a bunch of guys moving in one direction, blocking whoever's there, and letting your running back sort it out after that. On a lot of those big power plays, even stuff like the power sweep or student body right or left, you're not necessarily trying to block one specific guy with another specific guy. You're trying to get a bunch of bodies in a certain space and figure things out from there. A lot of this chapter reminds me of when Bill Belichick immediately brought up the single wing when talking about the Wildcat. There's really nothing new under the sun. There's certainly nothing new in football. So that's why I wonder if it might be better to talk about things being popularized versus being invented. Of course, at some point, someone did have to invent these things, but most things seem to have been tried pretty early. You want to look up some stuff like that. Look up the innovations of Amos Alonzo Stagg at the University of Chicago. We talked about him, I think, way back in chapter one or two, but he is the guy who invented a lot of the things that we think of as relatively modern in football. Things as basic as how practice was structured 
how you go about running a football practice were innovations from way back in the early 20th century. So little of this is actually new. And zone, zone blocking certainly isn't. As far as interesting stuff from this chapter, I really have two thoughts. First, they're both kind of related to each other. First, I thought it was interesting that Mudd insisted that zone blocking is easier than man-to-man blocking. That seems counterintuitive to me, at least, although I can see why it's the case when you, when you read about it. In man-to-man basketball, or in, in basketball, man-to-man defense is oftentimes more simple than zone defense. If you played, say, a 1-3-1 versus just man-to-man defense, you can see why that's the case. There's a lot of rotation. There's a lot of spacing. There's a lot of um, situational awareness that goes around goes on in zone defense that you don't necessarily have to have, at least not at the same level, in man-to-man defense. And people will quibble with that. There is a lot of situational awareness that goes into man-to-man. But it, it, is, it does just boil down to as simple as, as stopping one person. But in football, that's a little bit different. It would seem that man-to-man blocking or just man blocking is simple and straightforward, but Mudd says that's not necessarily the case. He explained it by saying there are fewer things that can go wrong because you're creating this mush where guys are working with the guy next to him and there's just less space for things to go wrong. Now, with this, of course, you're going to lose some of the techniques that I grew up with, the angle blocking and pulling, but it just it's just easier. That was a very interesting quote. First, because an offensive line lifer actually said that something about the offensive line was easy. And secondly, because of, I guess, again, that sort of counterintuitive nature. Zone blocking seems very complicated, but it really just amounts to getting a bunch of guys moving together in one direction. And the second thought I had related to that was, I wonder if that's partly the reason the Packers have had so much success with their offensive line over the couple of, the last couple of years, especially using different configurations and moving guys around so much. I think if you can simplify people's responsibilities, it's got to be easier to succeed. And maybe zone blocking is just that simplification of responsibility. If the Packers have unlocked that, that's a that's a great asset. And as we turn to the Packers connection portion of this chapter review, I think it's easy to see why why they may have some inside or extra insight into what makes zone blocking the most effective. So I mentioned at the last, the end of the last episode that we were going to talk about Alex Gibbs today. Alex Gibbs recently passed away, but he was considered the mastermind uh, behind the Denver Broncos running game and their zone blocking scheme that they used in the mid-90s. It always kind of was interesting to me and, and interesting to me since that people have, you know, praised the the Broncos for coming up with a system or, or popularizing, I should say, circling back to what I said earlier, popularize this system where the running back almost truly doesn't matter. You know, running backs are interchangeable. I remember Sports Illustrated in the early 2000s or maybe late 90s had a piece about what they called building a Bronco back, uh, just finding a guy who could fit the scheme that they wanted and just plugging him in and, and letting him run loose. Uh, it seemed like they could do it with somebody different every single year, which makes me wonder why people get worked up, so worked up about Terrell Davis. If the Broncos were so, so much at the forefront of proving that running backs can be interchangeable, why are we so excited about a guy who just happened to be successful in the scheme that is supposed to make every running back productive? It seems like there's some cognitive dissonance there, unless you want to say that Terrell Davis was just so good that he would have been great in any system, and maybe that's the case. But if you're talking about the Broncos system being so good, why are you giving so much credit to Terrell Davis for just, I guess, doing the job that they're they're insisting in the very next breath that almost anybody could do? Anyway, that it's neither here nor there with Alex Gibbs. Well, I guess it's it's there because he was there for it, but that's not what I was trying to say. Alex Gibb has at least two routes to significant connections to the Packers. First, you can say he worked under Mike Shanahan, uh, which gives him connections, uh, at least philosophically, to Kyle Shanahan, who then gives us some connections to Matt LaFleur, but there's actually a, a different, more direct connection between Gibbs and LaFleur. In 2008 and 2009, Gibbs was the assistant head coach and offensive line coach for the Houston Texans. Who else happened to be there at that time? Not just Matt LaFleur, though there was LaFleur as the offensive quality control coach. Yes, the other name that was there was Adam Stenovich, who was on the, pa- the Texans practice squad in 2008 and nine. Uh, as an offensive lineman and would have had firsthand knowledge of Gibbs's 
uh, schemes and preferences and things such as that. So there's two significant connections between Gibbs, the modern-day mastermind of the zone-blocking scheme, and uh, and Matt LaFleur, and I guess along those same lines, Adam Stenovich. Maybe it shouldn't be such a mystery that Stenovich has done such a great job on the Packers' offensive line, considering who he got to learn under in his formative years as an NFL player. Just something to keep in the back of your mind as you're, you're thinking about the Packers' offensive line this year, which I encourage you to do as much as you can. Learn as much as you can about the offensive line because that is going to give you a lot of insight into football as a whole. What about a little bit long today, but I think that's okay. I'd love giving you a little bit of bonus content now and then. But that is all I have for you on this particular episode of Blue 58. If you enjoyed this episode, I would encourage you to share it with someone you think would enjoy it. That is going to help us grow the show, get more people involved in this conversation around the Packers, and ultimately help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And that's great because, as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.